So thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, for those of you who have been with us in the past, welcome back. And for those of you who are joining for the first time, welcome to our virtual seminar series. We're proud that this is continuing to go on and that there is the interest out there and we will continue to bring you these seminars as long as there is interest. So this is our third year of presenting um, to you, the audience, the latest in terms of the research findings that many of you are participating in these research studies. So thank you. And I just, sorry, I know Kelly's doing in introductions, but I just wanted to emphasize that a lot of the topics that we're choosing to present this year is really based on the feedback we get from, from the, the attendees. So please continue to give us feedback on the sorts of topics you'd like to hear more about. Excellent. And just a reminder, for those of you who don't know us, actually, I'm Kelly Metcalf, and I'm one of the scientists in the breast cancer group, and Joanne Katsopoulos, another one of the scientists. So welcome. We're, we're happy to bring these seminars to you. And just in terms of a few housekeeping uh, issues, if you have a question, and many of you will, please enter your question in the Q&A at the bottom and it will be a typewritten question. And then we can ask Aletta at the end. We've left time obviously for some of your questions because we know they are important. So with that in mind, uh, let's get started today. So I'm very happy to introduce my longtime colleague and friend, Aletta Paul, who is one of our genetic counselors at Women's College. Many of you, if you are a Women's College patient, have met with Aletta in the past. And she's very knowledgeable in the area of hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. And Joanne and I have asked her to come today because we do think there are so many issues that are important for the family to know about when we're thinking about genetic testing. And often in, in the rush of doing some of these genetic tests, we forget about the family a little bit. So Alette is here to really highlight some of the issues that uh, we need to be thinking about in terms of letting our family know about our genetic test results and some of the other uh, issues and implications that there are for the family. So thank you, Aletta, and welcome. I'm gonna turn off my mute and I'm handing it over to you now, so thanks. And can I just reiterate, when you're asking your questions, try to keep them a little bit more general um, because the personal questions take a lot more time and thought. So we wanna keep this more of a general discussion that everybody can benefit from. But of course, if you have questions afterwards, we're happy to continue to try to answer them for you. Great. All right. Thanks. Uh, hello, everybody. It's uh, a cold Friday. <laughs> At least it is here in Ontario. Um, so welcome uh, to the first talk. And um, everybody can hear me OK? Yeah. OK, great. So I'm going to be going over some of the implications of genetic testing to the family. Um, and so this is sort of what comes out of somebody finds out they inherited a mutation in a hereditary breast cancer gene. So they carry the gene. And now what about my family? So I'm kind of just going over basically who needs to be told, when and how. And sort of the outline of the talk is I was going to do start with some review. And I'm sorry, some of you may already know this, but I always feel like it's really important to understand the importance to the family. You have to make sure that you understand uh, what it means to carry a gene mutation. Um, and so I'm going to talk just briefly about hereditary breast cancer, some of the risks and management. I'm just touching on these things um, as a reminder. So everybody's working from the same base, uh, going over the inheritance. And then um, I'm going to have an example uh, to show you and then talk about some of the, the challenges. But maybe I'm going to try to give you a few tactics and resources that may help with this process. And so hopefully that will be helpful. And I'm happy to answer questions at the end. So in terms of genetics, I think most people have just this vague idea. I always think this slide shows how we feel about genetics in general. So this is sort of how it works, is that you know, we take things from both our parents and we're the combination of that. But it is a little bit different in the hereditary cancer field. Um, and I always like to back up and start with the fact that cancer is just common in general. And most cancers are not due to genes we could test for. And 
everybody is at risk of cancer. Um, whether you have a gene mutation or not, <laughs> everybody can still get cancer. And if you look at the stats in Canada, they say almost half of Canadians will develop cancer in their lifetime. Though a lot of those are skin cancers, but still it's very common. Um, and specifically when it comes to breast cancer, one in eight women will develop breast cancer. So as long as you have breasts, you don't get away from that one in eight risk. Um, and we're seeing more cancer in Canada in general and um, in a number of other countries just because of our aging population. And age is one of the best, biggest risk factors for cancer in the general population. So that's sort of a natural consequence. Now I'm gonna switch a little bit to specifically about breast cancer, those one in eight women who get it. If we looked at all women with breast cancer, most of them are not due to genes that we could test for. It's actually this little blue wedge. It's sort of roughly somewhere between maybe 10 to up to 15% of all breast cancers happen due to some kind of gene that we could test for. Um, out of the remaining people, there are a very significant proportion that just get breast cancer because they're that one in eight. And then we see some families that are a little bit more prone to get breast cancer, but it's not due to anything we could test for. So at the top right hand side of the picture here, I've got shown a group. Those are all women who got breast cancer. A good chunk of them got it, are the gray who just got it by chance. There are some people in black who are a little more prone in that familial group, but we're focusing on these red people who have an inherited predisposition to develop breast cancer. Now, some people get confused because they hear that all cancers are genetic, and that's absolutely true, but that doesn't mean they're all hereditary. Um, so if you look at cancer cells, you'll find lots of mistakes in their genetic material, and that's why they're behaving badly. Their <laughs> cancers are basically cells that have gone bad. They're growing disproportionately. Um, but the mistakes are just in the cancer themselves. Where the hereditary component comes in is you have to have something that's in essentially all the cells of your body. And because it's in all the cells of your body, it can also be in some of your eggs and sperm cells, which means then it can be passed down to the next generation. So that's what we're kind of talking about here with hereditary breast cancer, is that there is a, um, a genetic mutation or a mistake in a gene um, that is helping to protect us against cancer and that can be passed down through the family. So why does this mistake cause a problem? Well. If you have a normal working gene um, that is correct, the gene is actually the instruction for a protein that's helping to protect you against cancer. For people who are born with a mistake, say in a BRCA1 gene, for example, then what happens is that protein, the, the, the instruction is wrong. So either the protein doesn't work properly or maybe there's just no protein at all. And so because of that, you, people who carry a mutation are not as good at fighting off cancer as someone who has a good working protein. Um, and by the way, I also just want to briefly touch on, I'm talking about in this talk, people who are born with either what they call a pathogenic or likely pathogenic mutation, which means these are ones that are definitely broken <laughs> and abnormal proteins that are not working properly. Some people may find something that's called a genetic variant of uncertain significance. So there is a difference in the gene, but it could be that they still make an absolutely fine protein. Um, so those are the cases we're not talking about here um, because it's not clear that those people are necessarily at increased risk of cancer. I'm talking about the people that we're fairly confident that they are at increased risk. And you've probably heard all this, but we, we look for in the families as in signs of something that a breast cancer could be hereditary as opposed to just being that sporadic one in eight is you tend to see multiple people getting the same kind of cancer like breast cancer. You tend to see it in multiple generations. Generally speaking, they're getting the cancers at younger ages. You may get people getting breast cancer more than once or getting multiple types of cancer. Um, we also look for certain combinations of cancers that can imply that maybe um, 
there's certain genes involved, like for the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, breast and ovary cancer are thought to go together, and there can be other combinations for other genes. And then we also know there's some populations that are at high risk um, to develop or not to develop, to have, uh, to carry one of these mutations, um, such as the Ashkenazi Jewish population, but there are other ones as well, but they're one of the higher risk groups. And you really have to look at both sides of the family. This can be inherited either from mom's side or from dad's side. I'll be showing you a bit later <laughs> just why that is. And if families meet certain criteria in Canada, they may be eligible to have testing, genetic testing paid for um, by the province. This is typically, um, up, currently, it's now much more often not just BRCA1 and 2, which is what it was in the past. Now they're typically testing people for those two genes plus some other hereditary breast cancer genes. But ideally, for the most information in a family, you usually want to start testing somebody with cancer if possible. Um, but that's not always possible. And sometimes healthy people can get testing if nobody is living, for example. So if we think back to that little wedge of 10 to 15 percent um, of people who are found to have um, a genetic reason for the cancers, what we'll see is there's a number of different genes that can be involved, but the bulk of them are really BRCA1 and BRCA2. They really account for a big portion of it. Um, and they're, it's basically because they're not that rare. Some of these other genes are less common, uh, but we are, um, now that we're testing people for more of these genes, we're finding more people with these, uh, that have mutations in these other hereditary cancer genes like CHECK2, P10, ATM, P um, TP53, CDH1, some of the Lynch genes, which are the colon cancer ones that may also have a bit of breast cancer risk, COLB2, RIP1, and others. So, so all of those genes are increasing the risk of cancer, but they're not all necessarily increasing it to the same level. Um, so it's important to be aware of that, but they're all definitely increasing the risk, but some are what we call more moderate risk genes that while it's a bit of increased risk, it's not as significant as um, BRCA1 and BRCA2. And what this graph is trying to show you, it's trying to show you in blue, the level of cancer risk um, as compared to the population level. So the green is the, what the average person is, this is what a carrier of a specific mutation is. I have a few different cancers here at the bottom. I've got breast, ovary, pancreatic, stomach, colon, melanoma and stuff. And then on this bar, I've tried to indicate roughly for some of the genes, the maximum risks that can be uh, um, attributed to possibly uh, some of the genes. So for example, BRCA1 carriers can have up to an 87% risk of developing breast cancer in their lifetime as compared to 12% in the population. And so these are some of the high risk genes like P10, BRCA2, TP53. Then these are getting into the more moderate risk genes um, and their risk is more, you know, PALB2, they're thinking around 58, ATM up to 52, SDK11, and so 40 to 50 to 60% in this kind of range. And some of the risks, just some of the genes are just for breast cancer. Some of them will not only increase breast cancer, but might increase some of these other cancers. So there can be an increased risk of ovarian cancer uh, for some of the genes like BRCA1 and 2. Uh, pancreatic for um, some of the genes. Oh, actually, I should have Paul B2 on there, though I don't. Um, stomach, colon, melanoma, uterine, and things like that. So the exact risk levels, usually a person who finds out about a mutation will be told that for them, um, the cancers that are associated with their gene. But what you will note is those are all some significantly increased risks above the population level. As I touched on before, not only are we seeing much higher risks, but we are seeing, um, generally speaking, at earlier ages. The ages, again, vary by the gene. Now, I'm not going to go through for every single gene the risks and, um, and ages, but we've been studying BRCA1 and BRCA2 a long time, so we know more about these genes. Um, and so for breast cancer, that 
maximum risk that was given, we think is a little bit inflated. Um, in our clinic, we sort of think the risk probably to age 80 is more like 70%, but the median age of diagnosis, so this is the age where half the people are diagnosed is much earlier than in the general population. They think it's around 42 for BRSA1. So half the people with a BRSA1 mutation who get breast cancer get it before 42, the other ones afterwards. In the general population, that risk, that median age rather is 62. So it can start in the late 20s, but we see a lot in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. For BRCA2, similar end risk, but the median age is a bit older, is 48. Um, but we can see them at the same, starting also in those early days. Um, for ovarian cancer risk, for BRCA1, there's more risk. It's around 40%, with the median age of diagnosis around 48, which is, again, much younger than the general population. For BRCA1, the ovarian cancer risk starts around age 35. There's not that many between 35 and 40, but we see more in the 40s and 50s. BRCA2 has less ovarian cancer risk with an older median age of diagnosis, a bit closer to the population risk. Um, the risk starts around age 40, but a lot happening in the later 40s, 50s, 60s. So it's going to be important when you're thinking about when to test people and um, when they should be thinking about it. It depends a lot when these risks are starting. So this is why I'm going over some of these risks and numbers because um, it really can impact on people and when they might take action to prevent these cancers if they are at risk of developing them. But while there's all these risks, which can be very scary, there are things we can do about it. And I think there's going to be much more that we're going to be able to offer in the future as well. But right now, there's extra screening that people can do. Um, and I'm just focusing on the breast and ovary risk. For some of those other cancers that I touched on, there are other screenings. I just didn't want to make this too, um, too long to go through. But, you know, um, for people that are at risk at a young age, they can not only have yearly mammograms, but they can also have yearly breast MRIs. And those are really important because mammograms don't work that well in young people at finding breast cancer. Um, mammograms were really meant for women in the general population who get breast cancer when they're older. They really need those breast MRIs. Um, and I'll come back to a bit later why that may be important. There is screening in theory for ovarian cancer, but it's not really very effective at picking it up early. It's not reliable, um, but there are medications people can take that can reduce cancer risk. Sometimes there's risk reducing surgeries. Uh, people can consider, um, and Angelina Jolie um, has made it very public that she's a BRCA1 carer and she did choose to do both these risk reducing surgeries. Um, though it's not everybody's choice, um, but these are just some of the options that are out there and available. And I think what's also a new and sort of upcoming area is that for people who end up getting cancer who have, say, a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation, and maybe some of the other genes as well, we're getting to the point that there may be specific treatments that may help them do better to be cured of their cancers. So there's uh, specific chemotherapies we think may work better. There's also targeted medications that are now being approved in Canada and may, people may be eligible for that, um, one of them called a laparib. So it's gonna be important to really know who has these carries and mutations. And in the future, there may be better things that are available. It, what they're looking at and starting to do trials on is they're looking at blood tests that will find early signs in your blood of cancers that are just starting and can tell different cancers apart. Now, this is definitely still in the trial phase. This is not mainstream yet, but it's very exciting that if we can reliably pick up cancers early, then we may have yet another strategy that people can use that may be more palatable than some of the currently available options. So the key thing is we need to find these people because there may be great things or there may be gene therapies that become um, possible to actually go in and correct the mistake. So if you have a BRCA1 mutation, maybe they'll be able to go in and fix it. 
I think in the future generations, there really will be much better options than what we have now. So we need to know who's at risk. Um, I just want to touch on where the genes are located. This is just sort of um, a, maybe just a little bit of interest is the genes are made of DNA. If we look down at this little picture down here at the left on the bottom, um, the genes are basically units of instructions that we're all born with. And these instructions are packaged onto chromosomes and you can have a thousand genes on one chromosome. And the chromosomes are all found in the nucleus of the cell. Now, if we take one single cell and you break it open and you look at the chromosomes and you organize them, this is basically what it looks like. This is called a karyotype, but basically it's a picture of the chromosomes in one single cell. And usually how they organize them is from largest to smallest. Um, so, and what you'll notice is you have two of each. So you get a set from mom and a set from dad. And so there are 22 pairs of chromosomes. Um, and these 22 are the same between men and women. So it's exactly the same. There's no differences. The only difference between men and women is in the 23rd pair, the last pair of chromosomes. This is a woman because she has two X's. If this was a man, he'd have only one X and he'd have a little Y chromosome. Everything else is the same. And why this is important is all the genes we're talking about have nothing to do with the sex chromosomes. They're all the ones that are the same between men and women. And this is why it doesn't matter which side of the family, men are just as likely to pass this on. They can have it just the same. So as I said, they can be inherited for mom or dad. So how it's passed down um, is what's called autosomal dominant inheritance. But all this means is um, you only need to have one non-working copy of the gene for it to uh, be causing an issue. So I've, there's two scenarios on this slide. One is that the father is the carrier. So he has um, a, a good copy, the purple one of say BRCA1, and he has a non-working copy. The mother has two working copies. This is the exact same scenario, except in this case, the mom is the carrier. So if a parent has this, when they're making, if it's a man, if he's making sperm or if a woman is making eggs, when they're going to have children, they can only put the one of each of, <laughs> of the chromosomes into the egg or sperm, and they'll get one from this parent. So from this parent, either one is fine, doesn't matter. For the carrier parent, it's a 50-50 chance whether they pass on the good one or the bad one. And it doesn't matter if they're boys or girls, they're flipping a coin for each child. So it's a 50-50 chance. And so what you'll see is it doesn't matter if it comes from a man or a woman, you're still ending up with the same ratio is that statistically, it's half of the kids will get it, half will not. The other thing that's important about dominant inheritance is it, it can't skip a generation. So when it comes to the next generation, if someone is a carrier like this little boy here, when he grows up and has children, his children will have a 50-50 chance of having it. But if we take his sibling who has no, both her copies are fine, her children cannot have this mutation. She just doesn't have it to pass on. So it cannot skip a generation. So it is definitely important to know for an adult if they are born with one of these gene mutations. Um, there's high cancer risks. Um, they start at a young age, but there's things we can do about it. So usually how it works in Canada is once a pathogenic mutation is found, say, in a BRCA1 gene or BRCA2 or one of the other ones, all the at-risk relatives, so the people in the family who could potentially carry it, are eligible to have testing for that specific gene mutation. And this is free. So um, cost shouldn't be um, a barrier for people. And in 
they can be tested no matter where they live in Canada. They can be referred by their family doctor to their local genetics clinics. There's clinics across the country. Um, now, just from a practical standpoint, it's maybe useful to know that they may need a copy of the genetic test report of the person who got the testing because the lab where, where they go to needs to know exactly which gene has the problem and what exactly the mistake is in the gene so they know what to test for. Mm -hmm. One of the other pe thing people worry about is um, that they may be um, discriminated against by insurance companies, but there's now protection in Canada called the Genetic Non-Discrimination Act um, that helps uh, mean that insurance companies can't ask about this. So who needs to know in the family? Well, I'll tell you a story. And this is the story of Mary, um, who is um, a 38-year-old who just developed breast cancer. By the way, in pedigree, circles are women, squares are men. And so um, this story, by the way, is complete fiction. I made it up, <laughs> though it is based on uh, things and people I've seen. So I just want you to be... Um, if you're a Mary, don't worry, this isn't your story, <laughs> but it is based on things I have seen in clinic. So Mary has breast cancer, her mother did as well. Um, she goes in for genetic testing and she's found to carry a BRCA2 mutation. And she's told, well, you need to tell your relatives. Um, so she tells her sister, which was a good idea because her sister's at an age where she could get cancer but they don't go to the parents because the mother just had a stroke and they don't wanna worry them, but her sister gets testing happily, she's negative, so her kids don't need to worry about it. And then time goes by. So five years passes, everybody's a little bit older. Mary's been trying to put her cancer diagnosis behind her. She has teenage kids keeping her busy. But then all of a sudden, a cousin on her dad's side develops breast cancer at a young age. Um, and then about a month or so later, it turns out her aunt was found to have ovarian cancer. So now all of a sudden, the alarm bells are going off, people get testing. And so they realize, of course, that they have um, the same BRCA2 mutation. So those are cancers that essentially could have been prevented. Um, so if people had known about that their cancer risk was there, or maybe at least found at an earlier stage. And what this means is that the, Mary and her sister had assumed this came from her mother, who has now passed away. Um, but it turns out it actually had come from her dad and there just wasn't signs at that time um, that it was on that side. So we have this in genetics that sometimes we make assumptions that it comes from one side of the family and it isn't necessarily. Then when they start doing more investigation, it turns out because now they know it's on this side, so they start asking relatives, it turns out there was another cousin of her father's who had breast cancer at 34. She knew 10 years ago that she had a BRCA2 mutation. So even before Mary was diagnosed, but she never thought to tell her uncle who died young kids about it <laughs> because he was a man and they weren't really thinking about that at the time. So there's just, um, it is really important to know about these things and at least for people to be aware and have the option of preventing some of these cancers. So who needs to know? Well, really ideally all at-risk relatives. We don't usually test children unless they happen to be at risk of cancer um, before age 18, uh, which is generally not the case. It's really important not to forget about the men. And what we also see a lot in families is that they, of course, they tend to tell their immediate relatives, which is great and important, but ideally don't stop there. Your cousins are at risks, aunts and uncles, um, and sometimes older relatives can really help clarify the risk, which side of the family. So sometimes we like to test parents, even if they're very elderly and it maybe won't make a difference for them, but it really helps clarify, is it mom's side of the family we need to be worried about or dad's side? And I think some people think 
genetics clinic share all their information and we have some master database and people would find out about this and no, there is no such thing. <laughs> um, and without this knowledge, your relatives might not be able to get genetic testing. So if I go back to the scenario when Mary was diagnosed and she found out she had a mutation, her cousin, if she'd gone into a genetics clinic and said, hey, my cousin just got breast cancer at 38, can I have genetic testing? The clinic would say no. They might say, oh, your cousin can get testing or you can ask them, but she herself wouldn't be eligible for testing unless Mary tells the cousin, oh, I have a mutation, then all of a sudden the cousin would be eligible for testing. So it does make a difference. And there are some special considerations too that you can also have, I was focusing on the dominant inheritance, which is you know, really what's most important for most of these genes. But for some of them, they also have an additional risk um, that say if you have a, carry a BRCA2 mutation, if you carry that mutation and so does your partner, you can end up with a scenario where one of your children gets a bad copy from both parents. So that child has no working copies of BRCA2. In some cases, that child will never develop in the first place, but it may. And then that child can have a different uh, childhood onset disorder. Um, in, for BRCA2, that's fancomi anemia. So there are a number of the hereditary breast cancer genes where this is the case. So um, if you have no working copies of ATM, you can have a condition called ataxia telangiectasia, which is a neurodegenerative disorder. All of these genes can cause Fanconi anemia, but the problem needs to be in the same gene. So if you, if you have no working copies of BRCA2, if both are broken, you can have Fanconi anemia. But if you have one BRCA2 mutation and a POLB2 mutation, that does not give you that. Those are still considered separate. And some of the Lynch genes, which they're testing for now, um, these are the hereditary colon cancer genes that also might slightly increase breast cancer risk. If both of those are broken, you can have something called constitutional mismatch repair deficiency syndrome. Um, where you are very prone to get cancers at quite a young age, like colon or um, brain or other ones. With Fanconi anemia, that's a, um, a condition with bone marrow failure and very prone to leukemias. So for people who are carriers that are planning to have children, their partners are also eligible for testing. So it's not only um, the person themselves, but they can get it to make sure that their children are not at risk of those serious conditions. So if I go back to Mary, um, it turns out her cousin carried a mutation unbeknownst to her, and her partner did as well. And she had a son who had no working copies of BRCA2 and ended up having Fanconi anemia and getting leukemia at age five. So this is, of course, as I said, a fictional story. In my practice, those um, recessive disorders um, like Fanconi anemia and things are quite rare. And while it can happen, it may be a bit mutation dependent, but we don't know which mutations this may contribute to that and which don't. And so we really encourage testing partners just to make sure this doesn't happen. So, um, there's that. So what we find is a lot of people want to share in principle, but there are just challenges and barriers to this. Um, it's complex information um, and sometimes either to explain or sometimes people don't understand. And these are just hard conversations. It can be hard for the person trying to tell people. It can also be hard for the people receiving on the receiving end of that. And I don't want to trivialize this. This is not always easy. There's definitely can be guilt. Nobody wants to pass on anything bad to their children or know that their relatives have it. Um, though I would remind people that we all pass on bad things to our children, whether we like it or not. If it's not a BRCA1 gene, then it's diabetes or heart disease or dementia. We all have crap that we pass on. 
Then, of course, there's just family dynamics, complex relationships um, that plays into a lot of the challenges. Or people are just in distant families. They don't know their relatives. They may be adopted or estranged. There also seems to be cultural barriers. We feel, we see, um, observe that in some minorities, this information seems to be harder to share than in other groups. And then sometimes people don't think they're, it's important for people to know because maybe they're just, they're too old and we don't want to bother them with that or they're men or they're cancer patients and they must know about this already. And that's not always the case. Um, so I wanted to give you a few tactics about how to manage some of these things. So sometimes what can make it easier to share complex information is using what we call a family member letter. And so it can be a basic one page thing that explains a little bit about the mutation, the inheritance and that people are at risk. This can be anonymous and can link back to a clinic. You may be able to get a letter like this from the clinic that you went to if you had genetic testing and you carry a mutation. And it makes it easier that you don't have to explain um, everything. And I'm gonna share also resources where you can, if you wanna make your own version, you can do that as well. And in terms of how to do it, use any means that works for you. I don't think there's a right or a wrong way to do this, but it's better to get the information out there. So whether it's phone, face-to-face, -face, text, email, mail, apps, social media, whatever works for you, just it's better to do it than worry about doing it the right way. Just get the information out there um, to the people that need to know. Uh, some people find email easier because then they can attach things like they can attach a family member letter um, or they can attach their report so that the people have it to go and get referred to their local genetics clinic. I've had a patient just recently who wanted to tell her relatives, but um, her mother has passed away and she hasn't been in touch with her mother's relationships for various reasons in that family but try to go to the relative that you do know or do still talk to. So there was a cousin on her mom's side that she did still stay in touch. So talk to that person, get them to tell their mother and their aunt that, you know, there's this mutation in the family and they need to get testing. So just work with the person that you're comfortable with um, and you can delegate. So task a relative. Say if you have a whole bunch of cousins, tell a few of them and get them to put the word out. You can also use your genetics clinic as a resource for various things like um, getting family member letters, um, giving information about where relatives can get testing. Um, sometimes they can find out the specific clinic they can go to. And so there are options. Um, some people find what's a useful strategy is when you're going for testing is to let people, your relatives know about that because then you can also have a conversation before it's like, do you want to know about this? And, or at least they're primed about it. So they're not surprised when that information comes. Um, though if you've already had the testing, that may be too late, but that is a strategy some people find helpful. And I sort of, for the, in terms of that perceived relevance piece I was talking about before, I think it's better to overshare in the sense of, even if you think somebody knows, maybe just check in that they know, um, like sometimes again with that cancer patient, they say, well, their doctor must have talked to them about it. Well, maybe they did, but maybe they didn't. Maybe they were somehow fell through the cracks and they didn't get testing and they don't know about the mutation in the family. I did want to say you're not responsible for what relatives do with it. Like whether they go for testing, that is up to them. But what is a really helpful message to get across to your relatives is because they, we do find people don't always understand what the risks are and why it's important, um, is really encourage them to go talk to a genetic counselor. Even if they have no interest in testing whatsoever, go talk to a counselor who can at least explain it to them. And then um, hopefully they can do it if they want to. Some people will still say no and that's fine, but at least they were fully informed. There are, when it comes to telling children, there are sort of special um, 
interests, like uh, special situations and considerations. And there have been talks on this in the past a little bit more. Uh, Gina McQuay gave a, a good talk that touched on this in a bit more detail. Um, but when you're thinking about children, you have to think about, and I'm also talking about sometimes adult children um, in terms of when to share this information. You have to think about when they're going to get these cancers. So they're, you can't wait too long <laughs> um, at a certain point um, because they can get cancer while you're not telling them about this. Uh, for younger children, their age and maturity, um, at what point can you do something differently? What other things are going on in their life? Um, I had kind of be mindful of motivation. So I've seen parents not tell people because they thought they couldn't handle it or it was too much at the time. And then what happened is their child got cancer and instead they were left with dealing with that. And which is why it's not wait until too late. But I've also seen people really push their young children to get testing because they want to know. Um, so make sure it's, it is for younger children. It is their choice about when to go. In general, for BRCA1 or 2, our clinic generally recommends that you have, if a young female have testing around age 25 and definitely by age 30, um, because that's when the cancer risk start and that's when the management can start to happen. And the problem is if the, your child doesn't know about this, your adult child, say a 28 year old doesn't know there's a cancer risk, a high cancer risk at their age. Also their doctor doesn't know. They can't get mammograms because there may be no reason for that. If it came say from the dad's side and there's no obvious close history and mammograms wouldn't work well anyway. And if they get a lump, the doctor's gonna think it's something benign. Um, and so they won't necessarily do the investigations that they should. Well, if they know there's potentially a BRCA1 mutation in the family, all of a sudden they'll start doing MRIs, they'll start doing biopsies and make sure that they're finding cancers early. So when to share this? Basically, there's not gonna be one size that fits all. You don't have to share with everyone immediately. Ideally figure out, um, we, we do sort of ideally in genetics, sort of cascade testing where you work out and you figure out first which side of the family needs to worry about this. And then ideally you test, say, an aunt or an uncle instead of testing their five kids. Because if that aunt or uncle doesn't have it, none of their kids need to worry about it. So you don't have to raise everybody's anxiety and everything around this. Now, it's never too late to share. Like, even if you found out about your mutation 10 years ago and haven't told your relatives or just told some of them, but not your more distant ones, please still share now. It can still make a difference. <laughs> um, and I know it's not easy, um, but there are hopefully going to be things that will make it easier. These are some resources that may be helpful. Um, there are genetics clinics across Canada. Um, on the Canadian Association of Genetic Counselor website, they have uh, somewhere where you can just go click, find your local clinic, put in your postal code and find the clinic closest to you. There's something similar through the states through the uh, National Society of Genetic Counselors. There's also some resources um, to have help about talking to relatives. So there's uh, a place called Gene Share that has sort of template family member letters that you can use and tools for sharing genetic risk. And then a quite a good website for carriers is one called FORCE, which is Facing Our Risk of Cancer Empowered, where they um, have all kinds of info and brochures and other resources on sharing this kind of information with relatives and also about sharing specifically with adults and sharing separately with children. So they have a lot of focused, really great information there. And so that's quite a good place to go and get information. Um, we know this is hard. And historically, what we have found is for every person we test, we don't get that many relatives coming in necessarily for testing on average. There are some families that are better, some ones that we get none from. Um, on average, I think it's around two. <laughs> so there's definitely more people at risk out there. And a lot of it is just because this is hard to do. So what uh, Dr. Kelly Metcalf has just got funded a new study where we're trying to develop an app to make this easy for both um, 
people, what we call probands, the person first found to have the mutation and their relatives to get this information. So it's going to be developed based on the needs and preferences of those people. We're actually going to do a whole working group, find out how, what would be helpful, what would make it work for them. And then we're going to develop a tool based on what they told us about that might have education pieces in it and do a lot of that talk that information, that background that's hard to convey. And it also might have a template letters to use. Um, it might have a place that you can put in emails of your relatives and something gets sent out to them with your permission. Um, and then even in an ideal world, we're gonna have it so that the relatives can just automatically sign up through the app to be contacted and sent to a genetics clinic where they can get appointments and uh, kits sent to them. So this, might take away a lot of the pressure off of the poor Mary and people like her who are left with trying to tell their relatives because we know it's hard, um, but that's not available yet, but we're stay tuned. That's an exciting new thing that's coming. And one of the key things I wanted to say is genetics isn't a static field. I've been in it for over 20 years and I've seen so many new great advances um, in technology. And this isn't, um, static and already it's it I feel like there's a whole new world coming in that we now essentially have the capacity to do whole genome sequencing which is looking at all the important genes in a newborn and this is what they sort of talked about in the movie Gattaca that came out in 90, 1997 was doing that that babies were born with sort of a ticker tape of they've got this probability to get heart disease and diabetes or cancer um, we're actually getting close to that world, though there's a lot of um, debate and dialogue about whether that should be done. And this is kind of going on in different countries across the world because our capacities have changed. Maybe at some point people will just know that they have these mutations and we won't have to go through all these hoops and trying to tell relatives, but it's not here yet. So we still need to keep working on it. Um, in the meantime, uh, but also I really want to encourage all carriers to stay in touch with their genetics clinics because also our whole understanding of these genes and especially the newer genes aside from BRCA1 and 2, our knowledge is really evolving. We're finding out new information, better understanding of risks. We might have better ways to manage the risk. So maybe in five or 10 years, we will have that blood test where we can start testing for cancer. So who knows what's coming? Um, stay tuned, stay in touch. And I hope this has been interesting and I'm available for questions. Thank you, Aletta. That was really a wonderful overview of the importance of genetic testing and being able to accurately communicate with your family and your family members. And we have a lot of questions that we're going to try to summarize a bit. There were a few individuals, and this is an interesting question, asking about what is the impact for an individual if both their mother and father are carriers of a pathogenic mutation in either BRCA1 or 2, or potentially even carry the same mutation? So maybe you can talk about inheriting a mutation from both parents and what happens, or even if you inherit a BRCA1 mutation from one and a BRCA2 from another. So... Those are two scenarios. So if the mutation is in the same gene, so say both carry parents carry the same thing, the same BRCA, both carry a BRCA1 mutation. It doesn't have to be the same mutation, but if it's in the same gene, then you have the scenario of this autosomal recessive inheritance that you can, um, it's more likely, first of all, you'll have a carrier child, but for BRCA1, Generally speaking, there are rare exceptions, but generally speaking, if a child has two, both the BRCA ones are not working, usually that is a lethal and that child won't develop in the first place. For some of the genes, as I talked about BRCA2, there's a chance this child may survive and have the Fanconi anemia. The separate issue is I do have a number of patients who have mutations in two separate genes. And so you don't, that's not this condition and you're not working about autosomal recessive inheritance. What it is, is each child has a 50-50 chance for each of the genes. So 
say somebody has a BRCA1 mutation and a POLB2 mutation, each of their children has 50-50 for BRCA1, 50-50 for POLB2. So they have to be tested for both. They could inherit neither. They could get one or the other or both. So the one kind of more unfortunate thing is if you carry two different gene mutations, there's a three quarter chance your child is gonna get something. But having two mutations doesn't put you at double risk. It just still, you're at high risk for breast and ovary. You're still doing the same kind of management. It's just more likely your kids will get one of those things. Does that? Yes, that's, sort of... okay. Thank you. That's very helpful. And there were quite a few questions about inheriting from both parents. Okay, we'll move on to so some other. I'm going to ask another question for you. And I think we're just trying to group these questions because there are a lot. And there are a lot about treatment and prevention. Mm -hmm. And because we didn't talk about that in this talk, um, if you are interested, you can go back and look at some of our previous seminars. But we're going to be covering a lot of this in the upcoming year. So please come back and ask those same questions. And they what are question? new and important things coming. Yeah, exactly. So, so please come in and listen to those talks as well and bring your questions. One question is about when to test men in a family is, I mean, we've talked a little bit about when to talk, test women right? Um, in terms of cancer risk management guidelines, but what about men? So uh, someone's son or nephew or something like that. Right. So that's a good question. So there's two elements that kind of play into that. One of the main ones um, is again, when they're at risk of cancer. So there are cancer risks to men, though, generally speaking, they tend to be less than for women, but definitely there can be an increased risk of prostate cancer, pancreatic melanoma. There's different things. So it depends a bit about when those risks start. Generally speaking, men have the option of waiting a bit longer before they get testing. So, for example, they don't have to come in at age 25. We don't feel like they're likely to get cancer usually at that age. Um, but they can, if it's a gene that has one of these autosomal recessive conditions, um, like one of these genes listed here, then there is a chance that a man may want to know sooner at a younger age for family planning purposes, that he may want to know that he, if he has that so he can have his partner checked to make sure that they also don't have the same thing and their, their children aren't at risk of those conditions. Right. So that's sort of the one caveat where I can see that you might do something a bit different. Right. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Aletta. So we have a question and you you talked about this a little bit, but in many cases, we don't know our family history or don't have access to family history, or perhaps we were adopted and we don't know who our biological parents are. Can you, I know it's a hard question and it's loaded and every scenario differs, but what can you, what can you um, add to that for someone who may not know their family history, but would like to know if they're at high risk? So for somebody who finds out they have a mutation, ideally, if you can somehow try to get in touch with relatives, sometimes there's a possibility, but sometimes there just isn't. Um, you know, if you're adopted and you have those records are sealed and you have no way of getting it, you can't do anything about it. So there are times, but sometimes trying to reach out, even if there's one person you know who may be able to know more about the family history sometimes like it depends if it's one of these situations where you've just been estranged from the family even if you can find some common friend that can somehow put someone in touch sometimes there's things like that the other thing is um if i look at sort of the reverse situation if you're adopted and you just want to know if you have these things you may not be able to get testing, but people can now pay for testing. So if people just don't have a lot of um, knowledge about it, they want to make sure they don't want to have one of these high risk genes. Um, we have something called the screen project where people can pay right now. It's around 250 us dollars. You get a panel of about 45 hereditary cancer genes, which includes all these important ones. Um, so there are ways that people can pay for it if that's an option for them. 
Oh, oh, sorry. So we can, so that's on our website and you bring up an important study our team is leading. So Aleta talked about meeting certain criteria in order to be eligible for genetic testing during, through the normal route. But in our research program, you can on your own pay the $200 fee that covers the cost of running the study and doing the testing and find out if you're a mutation carrier or not. And then get referred for additional counseling and support given, uh, depending on your results. And that's on our women's college website, the screenproject.ca, because our team really believes in population-based genetic testing and, and not everybody with the mutation does have a family history. And so it's important to be able to identify all mutation carriers if we really wanna impact, um, impact what they're doing to prevent disease. And I'm seeing that because I work mostly on a study where we're testing quickly people who were diagnosed with breast cancer. But sometimes I find somebody diagnosed who had no family history, turns out they had a mutation. It, like I wouldn't have thought it, but they definitely can. So um, I'm glad through that study, they get it for free, but ideally we'd wanna do it before they get cancer. And that's where the population screening comes in. So the screen project is for any adult across Canada who wants to pay for it, men or women, but you have to be an adult. Okay, Aletta, I have uh, I have another question here for you um, from, from someone who has two sons. They're both negative for the BRCA2 mutation that she has. Great. Does that mean if they have children that their children won't have to be tested? So is there a chance that their children could have inherited this same BRCA2 mutation as their as their Great. grandmother? It can't again skip a generation. They cannot inherit that BRCA2 mutation that was in the lady. However, you do always have to look at their other side of the family that they could inherit something from their other parent, mm -hmm. but they can't get that particular BRCA2 mutation. Right. So if it's not in that child's, it's not in your son's makeup, he doesn't have it to pass on. Good, good reminder. There's one more question about insurance, Aletta. Do, do you mm -hmm. want to talk a little bit about that? Um, you know, they're all there. When we first started genetic testing, there was a lot of concern about the implications for insurance being able to be covered by insurance. Can you talk a little bit about what the situation is currently? Yeah. So there was a lot of concern, and this stopped a lot of people from getting testing. Um, it ended up not bearing out, it's certainly not in Canada, you get your health care irrespective um, if you're a Canadian. <laughs> and so where, and you always had to disclose about family history. And so that still goes on that insurance companies can ask about family history and you still have to disclose that. But in 2017, they passed the Genetic Non-Discrimination Act that insurance companies cannot ask about genetic test results. So you don't have to disclose those test results. So there is now protection in place. And also for certain federal employees, there's also protection against employees, discrimination and things like that. So there is much more protection now. Okay. So I'm sorry if we weren't able to answer your question. We've done our best to try to address um, as many as we can. And I wanted to take the opportunity to thank Aletta for a really amazing and informative presentation. You've, you've been able to put a lot of information in this one hour session. And just there's a lot of questions in the Q&A about posting of these webinars. They're all being recorded and posted on our website. Uh, maybe we'll try to make that more available if you're not able to find it, or maybe we can send it out with the next link. And I just wanted to remind everybody that our next session is next month, Friday, March 3rd, and Dr. Michelle Jacobson will be talking about sexual health following mastectomy or oophorectomy. And I think she'll have a, a lot of information regarding managing menopausal symptoms and improving quality of life following preventive surgery. So on behalf of the team, uh, Dr. Metcalf, I don't know if you have anything else to add. No, nope, that, but that was a good way to kick off 2023. Thanks so much, Aletta. Well, right. thank you everybody for attending. Thank you, Aletta, for making the time. We appreciate your, your insight and have a great weekend, everybody. Keep warm. Yep. Bye. Thank you.